Hey everybody, welcome to Cowboy Leather and Shoe Repair. I'm Scott. Today, we're going to show you, I got some uh, shoes over here that uh, a customer brought in. They want uh, one inch lift, put on one shoe, on the right shoe. And we'll, I'll show you what we're doing with those. Just walk with me. Don't mind the lights, they're bright. All right. What we got here is customer brought in. These are winter shoes. Three of them. Now they got to be lifted. Got to put a, a one inch lift on the sole here. I've already put a quarter inch in. Got them prepped up. Got them glued. And this is their house shoe. Same thing has to be has to have a uh, sole lift on it. Now we're going to put this a half inch uh, medium density uh, so yeah soling uh, sheets. I cut this out. I get it uh, in thirty six by uh, thirty six by thirty six. And sheets now we do here like I say what I'm gonna do is I've already put a quarter inch on we're gonna put the half inch on and then we're gonna follow back with quarter inch with a texture on it I don't know if you can see that but all this it's a lot of cutting and gluing We just turn you a little bit here so you can see a little bit better what we're going to do. Just stick it on like so, like so, push down. Then I put it on my stand. I find a rubber mallet works better than using the shoe. All I do is just beat or beat around the edges here. Sorry for the vibration. Sometimes, depending on how the form of the shoe is, we have to take the heat gun and heat it up a little bit. But all I do is I just come around here and just work it a little bit. Now, that's ready to trim this off of here. We've been getting busier around here between the shoe repair and the leather work. Been selling a lot of stuff on uh, internet sales, which I'm not complaining. Now I usually put put these sole put it together like this. And I'll let them sit until that glue really dries good. Now I use barge, same as I use for my leather. You can use masters, you can use whatever. 
glue I see even people using that uh, wedge wood or edge wood that I've heard a couple leather crafters saying that they were switching because that stuff is they must have changed the formula because it's not holding like it used to but that's like everything else they got a good thing and they got to change it up so like I say that's just that's all we do and then we'll come around here put it to five and one and we'll trim around here and then go ahead and put the uh, the tread on but while we're letting that set up and cure a little bit better we'll tip this up here there we go All right, said again, things are getting busy around here, which I'm glad. Shoe repairs picking up. It's winter time, or excuse me, fall. So I'm getting a lot of people that are putting their uh, flip flops and sandals away and getting their uh, winter boots and winter shoes out. As, <clears throat> excuse me, and as far as the leather, Mm, I got a bad case of heartburn today. Uh, yeah, as far as the leather, that's picking up because it's getting to be Christmas. And I hope things pick up better than last year, being there you got that uh, product shortage. It's not short. It's sitting out in the water someplace off California. But anyways, maybe that's a good thing for us leather crafters. We can uh, get our stuff out there and our leather goods, wallets, purses, and belts and whatnot will be in more demand because people can't get, can't get the other stuff. Which brings me to the fact, I don't know how many people follow... Uh, these leather forums and whatnot that are out there. But this morning I was just reading down some comments on one of them. And, you know, the person asked, you know, when do you know when leather crafting goes from a hobby to a business? And good gravy. The comments that people put up. One guy made a comment. He said, Leather crafters are one step away from being homeless or poor. Now, I don't know if he was just teasing or if he was serious. If he was serious, I don't know what he's doing wrong. Because you're not going to get rich, but you can make a living at it. With me, I'll just give you a rough thing. I was working... An eight-hour job, second shift, and I was doing shoe repair and, you know, doing leather work. Well, as far as the shoe repair, from my address, 80-mile area, radius around me, there is no shoe repair shops. So, I kind of cornered the market on that. And, you know... Business took off when people found out that I was doing shoe repair and I was doing a uh, pretty good job of it. Uh, they started coming by, which more power. I, I'll never turn a job away unless it's something that I can't do or it's not fixable. And unfortunately, there's a lot of shoes. I'm not going to say where they're coming from, but they're coming from across the big water. And they're not repairable. They're what I call Taiwan two-timers. Two you wear them two times, they fall apart. You throw them away, go buy some new ones. But that's basically what's happening with uh, clothes, shoes, household products, you name it. And don't get me started. But anyways, uh, getting back to what I was saying. And so... What 
what I did, my business or my plan was, if I could make as much or more than my paycheck at the end of the week working a uh, regular job for three months that I was going to just dedicate my time to uh, do a leather work and shoe repair. Well, the three months came and went, and I was doing a bang-up job. I might have said I was getting rich, but uh, the money I was making for the shoe repair and the leather crafting, or it's not a crafting, doing the leather work, uh, supported what I needed for the shop. Buy supplies, buy leather, buy hardware, whatever. I didn't have to touch nothing out of my paycheck, and that was great. Now, so I quit. I quit my job, and I'm doing this, and I've been doing it now for, let's see, 11 years on the leather, and five years on the shoe repair. And the nice thing about it is I make enough between the two of them, between the uh, leather and the shoe repair, that I don't have to touch nothing. If I want to buy a new machine, I can do it. I bought out a shoe repair shop. I bought out a saddle shop. The gentleman made... Uh, you know, horse tack and you name it. Basically, he just did everything. Shipped all over the world. And he wanted to retire, so I bought his machine. You know, you've seen some of the machinery that I purchased from him. And which I was going to build a bigger shop. And he said, no, don't do that. He said, I'm not using this building. And, you know, in my other videos you've seen, I've had, you know, a bigger shop. Well... This past July, he passed away. The family want, didn't want uh, the building. He didn't want the uh, property. There was a building and a house. So they put it up for auction. I didn't want it because I didn't want the house and where it was. Taxes would eat me up, and I had to do some improvements and stuff like that on the building and the house. And I don't want to fool with being a landlord. So anyways, I moved, bought a... Uh, Excuse me, a 12 by 28 building. Attached it to the original building I started the shoe repair and leather work in. Butted them up next to one another, and here I am. And I don't think I've lost any business in the move. And things are right back to uh, full steam ahead. Like I say, as it gets colder, the weather gets a little nasty, like today it's raining and chilly. I got people coming in, picking up shoes, dropping off shoes, and I place in order for belts and different leather goods. <coughs> so, we're doing good. So, as far as, you know, when you take the leather from a hobby to a business is totally up to you. You do it when you feel comfortable and, you know, hey, when I did it, I did it, bit the bullet, jumped in both feet, and hit the road running. But, you know, and if you think about starting a shop or setting up a shop, my suggestion is, is you need a, a good sturdy table, something that, you know, you can get a eight foot long side on, lay it out, cut belt blanks or just lay it out and cut, do whatever. That's that's the main thing and you know you can go to different places you can get a workbench 
go to yard sales, flea markets, whatever, buy a good stout workbench, and you may have to adapt it. But I've got two tables in here. I got a wooden one made out of two by fours. The top on it is uh, one inch plywood. And that's good and solid. I use that one for cutting and assembly. The other one is made out of angle iron frame with one inch uh, plywood on it. Marine, I think it's Marine Glade. I bought it when I got the, uh, the other repair shop. And it's got uh, that red or orangish poly board on top. And that's where I do the shoe repair. And I do some hole punching and stuff like that on that. But you got to have a good solid foundation. If not, you'll never get anything punched out because every time you whack it, the hammer spits back at you or whatever. You're not getting a good clean cut. Good lighting. You know, it, I would say wherever you can find a little place big enough to set your tools up where your tools are handy. See, I've got everything on shelves. This is all hardware. If you come over here, those are magnetic strips I got from Harbor Freight. And those are tools that pretty much I'm using, you know, daily. And then I got boxes or whatever of other tools that I use occasionally. Like today, I had to put some uh, or grommets in a piece of leather. And like I said, the grommets are up there. I went over and used a, a hard board, cut the holes and popped them in there and finished the job off in five, ten minutes. But if you're going to do this, and you're going to set up a shop, give yourself enough room, but don't give, I, I would suggest, don't give yourself too much room that you're going to have to walk halfway across the shop to use a sewing machine or get something, you know, keep everything kind of close at hand. You know, time is money. And, you know, keep it in the back of your mind that if your business takes off, and you decide you want to expand or let's say you're hand stitching everything and you get tired of hand stitching and you want to buy a uh, sewing machine flatbed or you know harness machine give us leave yourself enough room where you can do it and you know you'd be all right hey i started on a block of wood and a hammer and some a few tools and now I got tools coming out my ears some of them I thought I needed but I didn't they were hand they were neat but I've got away from doing uh, hand tooling I don't do it unless customers specifically ask for it all my stuff is pretty much plain Jane it's uh, utilitarian uh, no frills and I sell it. But, yeah. Just, you know, if, if in doubt, if when you think that you want to take your leather hobby and turn it into a business, just sit down and talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to somebody else that, that you know, is in the business of leather crafting. And get a few pointers, you know, just don't take my word for it. Uh, get a few opinions. You know what they say about opinions, everybody's got one. So, I don't think there's much more that I can tell you. I just wanted to show you what we're doing, you know, and building up these shoes. And, you know, just touch base on, you know, the question of when... When you should take a hobby and turn it into a business. And the biggest thing is, is, you know, if you're going to turn it into a business and take that step, you're going to have to find a place to get your leather 
your hardware. Really, I mean, there's nothing wrong with dealing with them, but you got to step outside the box and maybe step away from going to the high dollar leathercraft stores and find your leather at the source, at the tannery or whatever. Here a week ago, my wife and I, we jumped in the truck and we took a ride out to St. Louis and we went up a little bit further and we found uh, some leather at another leather shop, or not a leather shop, but another saddle shop. And this pretty leather, it's pull up or crazy horse, whatever you want to call it. Well, this stuff comes from the tannery that supplies the leather for one of the top brand work boots in the United States. And I looked at it and I just, I mean, drool came out of my mouth. This stuff was so clean, so pretty. It had that pull up, you bend it, twist it, then you rub it and it goes right back to the color, but it was distressed, nice looking. Now there was one or two pieces that had uh, a blemish in it, but it's not noticeable. You can see the blemish from the from the back side, but the front side was just pretty. And the price was right on it. And the guy can supply me, you know, with all the leather I can use. So I thought, okay, I made a contact here. That's a big thing, make contacts. You know, if you find some place uh, that you can get leather cheaper than going to Weaver, Tandy, Springfield, whatever. You know, yeah, they, they may be able to ship it to you in two days. But you're paying for it. And when you get it, if you can't go right to them and you get it, you might be disappointed. With me, I was lucky enough to find this, uh, this place. And I looked at the leather. And... He didn't have any pieces. They were size. They they averaged uh, 25 to 26 square feet of nice, pretty leather. Now, being that it was, the way the guy explained it, the way, being that the tannery is one of the producers for this boot com work boot company, the boot company boasts that their boots are waterproof or water resistant. So I thought, okay, if it's waterproof, water resistant, I don't have to go and put oil on it because it's already oil tanned, waxed, and everything else. It's going to make some nice bags, wallets, and other cool leather goods. But you got to go step away from the box. You see leather crafters or whip out that, you know, use that name, Wicked and Craig and Herman Oak and, I mean, the list goes on. That's expensive stuff. And it's to the point where if you make a a slip or you cut a part that's not right you've just pretty much wasted so you know you, you don't feel as bad if you bugger up a, a piece of cheaper leather and really now some people out there will argue with me but the public doesn't know the difference between Herman Oak Wicked and Craig, all all them names, and Wicked and Craig is just the tannery. Herman Oak, just they're just names. I mean, I could take that piece of leather right there. Is you know, I could call it whatever I want. But at the end of the day, it's still a piece of leather. It's still tanned. It's leather. Yes, 
some of the uh, Wicked and Craig. Because you call it that, you can get a better dollar or higher dollar. But, you know, at the end of the day, you got to look at your price point. You got to look at what you're buying for to give yourself a bigger profit margin. Now, if you buy, we'll say you go to Joe Blow Tannery and you buy uh, a side of leather. If you look at that leather and then go to Tandy Weaver or somebody, some of these high dollar places, look at what you paid and compared to what that leather, same same leather, what what they're asking for it. I bought leather two sides for what one side cost. Of that fancy stuff and at the end of the day I, hey I use some of the fancier stuff but I don't let brand names influence me I buy what you can afford and if you want to go broke you buy the hot type top dollar at the end of the day maybe you will go you know be one step away from uh, starving and homeless but that's just that's just my opinion and like I say opinions are like buttholes everybody's got one so with that said I'm gonna back out of here it's time for me to do something constructive finish off them shoes and start my weekend but before I go I just want to say thank you to the people the 500 and I believe 501 people that have subscribed to my channel. I was wondering if I was ever going to get to 500. And I'm really tickled pink that I made 500. So, if you're new to the channel, please subscribe. Click the subscribe button. Hit the bell. We try and set up put up a video every week but sometimes we get busy we get distracted and before we know it friday's come and gone and i like trying to post on fridays so with that said everybody have a good weekend stay safe stay stay warm and stay dry if you're out in the midwest keep your head down the weather's nasty out there. If you're on the East Coast, about the same. Keep your head down, stay dry. Keep the powder dry. So, with that said, Cowboys out. Bye now.